So welcome to our next talk. Our speaker is Elisabeth Niekrens. She is a lawyer and um, she also works for the Digital Society in Berlin. And she studied in Leipzig. She studied uh, law in Leipzig. And she also um, worked in uh, criminal law and she wrote a um, series of books about chaos and transformation but today our topic is a little different. It is about how international treaties on metadata um, extradition work and how the EU evidence um, ruling will change this and how political persecution could have a new dimension in the future. So please give a warm welcome to our speaker, Elisabeth Niekrens. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks a lot for the announcement and the introduction, and I'm delighted to be able to talk um, to you about this topic today. As was mentioned in the introduction, I want to be uh, I want to talk about the EU perspective. So um, this is being um, talked about in Parliament right now, and I'm sure that um, many of you have learned about it. So um, in some countries, um, providers will be. Um, obligated to hand over uh, metadata. So this is not a singular um, prospect, but uh, it comes in a context of many other regulations of the past few years, and I want to bring some context into this whole matter. So it is also about um, international law that is being um, questioned here, especially when it's about um, electronically storing data. And we have to um, have a look at if we want companies like Facebook and Google to be able or to be obligated to hand over data to um, jurisdiction, for example, um, this is a topic in Germany right now because of um, hate crimes that are being committed on the internet. So it is not a question that um, we can have a single perspective on, but we need to look at it from different angles because um, it's going to be um, an international transfer of email and, and transaction data. And um, it is about the question whether and in how far German authorities should be involved in this question. And um, it's also about um, companies like TikTok from China or uh, companies from Russia that could be involved in criminal investigations in Germany or other countries because people meet up and um, that happens on those kind of platforms. So um, what is at stake here? Because it might be possible for Chinese authorities, um, for example, to get access to German data. And how would we react if these countries um, were able to um, access data from Germany. So um, what is being postulated is that um, the um, internet cannot be a free space anymore like it is at the moment, but um, we need access to certain kinds of data. And um, this is a debate that is uh, not universal and enough just yet. So I would like to um, get a few different viewpoints on this. So 
Um, what is this regulation trying to fix? As the EU Commission says, the Internet is largely privately owned and borderless for everyone except authorities pursuing cr criminal investigations. So cloud services, social media being um, important for our um, daily work and that means that many data is saved and that means that um, authorities and um, pr uh, criminal prosecution is interested in that. So the problem arises where data is saved um, across borders because then it is difficult for authorities to access them. Because normally um, authorities and police can only act within their own national borders. And there have been trends in the past few years, like uh, unilateralism and the um, and like um, authorizations widening across borders. So um, of course, police uh, forces and um, national authorities want access to data from abroad. And on the other, other hand, we also have um, directives that um, like kind of forbid this um, interaction between authorities and that rule that um, countries instead have their right to um, do like their own investigations and uh, rely on their own means. So if we think of unilateralism, that is um, problematic because uh, national sovereignty has the function to, um, to make uh, fundamental, uh, to defend fundamental rights. So let's have a look back or at the present how um, does this cooperation between um, authorities, law enforcement authorities work. This is how it works so far. For many years or even for centuries, we have had um, legal assistance treaties. Um, or called MLAT. So you have bilateral and multilateral treaties um, on how countries cooperate. So for example, we have um, rulings that regulate that um, people are extradited to um, other countries in case they have committed crimes there. And I think it is obvious that um, this law about extraditing can be very relevant uh, in international politics. So it is about extradition, but also like lower level uh, things like um, confiscating documents and devices and things like that. So um, Germany is part of many of these um, international treaties since uh, the Second World War. And normally it works like that. A country um, files for extradition or another um, kind of action, and then the other country has to check if that is um, within their interest. And then. Well. Um, there is, um, um, as, well, the proceedings are like that um, one state is then acting as um, in their function as a country within another country. But um, countries can also refuse. 
um, these kinds of um, cooperation, for example, for political reasons. But um, also dual criminality, because um, the crime that has been committed must be defined as a crime in both countries. For example, that was the case in um, with Puigdemont in Spain, who wasn't extradited from Germany because um, his crime is wasn't a crime in Germany. So this is because the countries just have a, a different def definition of what is a crime. Um, so the Ordre uh, Public is um, very basic things about the public order. Um, you always have, and the NBBC in Idem means that for every crime a person can only be prosecuted once and not twice. And the problem with this is that this is usually a diplomatic route and there are a lot of um, different organizations involved and that's why it takes a long time. According to the EU Commission, 10 months is the norm at the moment uh, between uh, the standards at the moment between EU countries. So everyone agrees that this should be um, easier and quicker, especially with electric data, which change quickly, so you can't use an IP address very long. Um, 2013, you, the US government tried to something new, they forced Microsoft to give them the emails from a user and the special thing was that the, these data were saved uh, at a Microsoft server and Microsoft did not comply. They said that you do not have uh, the right to request them and the U EU data protection law does not allow us to give you the data. Um, they, they lost in front of court, um, in front of the court, and the first part, and the second part, and the second instance, they one, um, because the court said that it is the law they wanted to apply is not enough to to force Microsoft to give the email to the uh, U.S. Um, prosecutors. So a lot of this court, ca uh, this case, came in front of, front of the Supreme Court, and a lot of international organizations. Um, had its reports in, for example, uh, Reporters Without Borders, and this resulted in a new law, namely the Cloud, Cloud Act, Clo Cloud meaning clarifying lawful use of data, and meaning that U.S. companies have to give con uh, data to U.S. prosecutors irrespective of where they are um, saved. If you are in conflict with the law of a different country, then the company is allowed to refuse if the person is not a U.S. citizen or if it risks the company violating the laws of another country, but not every country, but only countries with which the U.S. has some special treaty. At the moment, there aren't that many countries with which the U.S. has such a treaty, um, but recently the U.K. signed such a treaty, meaning that companies which are in the U.S. say um, companies in the U.S. are forced to either violate the U.S. or the EU law because the GDPR does not allow companies to give the data to the U.S. Uh, prosecutors, but in the U.S. they can be forced to do so. There's another reason for signing these treaties, because then you can also force companies to give data to EU, EU countries which are safe, stored in the U.S., and a lot of prosecutors in the U.S 
you want this because there are a lot of companies in the US. So that's why the UK signed such an agreement, as I already mentioned, in October. And there was a lot of cr criticism criticism of this because first of all it could be an example uh, for for another countries and hinein in soweit es um informationspflichten richtervorbehalt hürden sozusagen unter welchen umständen daten herausgegeben werden können geht wenn man sich aber vorstellt dass das abkommen so auch vorbild für but they did not specify what exactly this means for countries with different laws. So with the UK, they have a very similar law with the US, but it, they did not clarify what happens if a country has a much lower standards regarding uh, independence of judges and similarly. Um, so politically, you have to regulate with how the EU states uh, countries can access data stored in another country in the EU. That's how we get to the, the treaty I mentioned earlier. Um, the UK already signed the treatment because before they um, signed the EU uh, treaty, so that's kind of problematic because the EU should find an agreement before some country signs a tre treaty with another country. So what does this e-evidence um, treaty say? So this regulates the relationship of states in the EU. Um, there, are, there are different kind of data types and there are there are different uh, treatments of these different kind of data, but in basic st thing is that A, the state A or country A would not contact, uh, contact state B, but the uh, country A, let's say Bulgaria, would, for example, directly contact a company in Austria with uh, as a request, and Austria only has a the requirement that if the company does not comply, then the country B, in this case Austria, has to has to force the company to to give out the data. This has to be fairly quickly in the fastest case up to six hours. And there should be sanctions up to two percent of the yearly profits. So this strictly violates the sover sovereignty of the country because another country can co contact the company directly. And the biggest problem is that the the criteria, criterion of mutual um, crimes is not um, not necessary. What does that mean? Um, in most cases, the the laws are not similar. So, for example, in Malta, it's illegal to abort. Um, if a, Malt uh, a doctor from Malta um, does these abortions and communicates w with German people via Posteo, then Posteo could be forced to give data to the Maltese, um, Maltese um, prosecutors. And in Poland, it's illegal to to say that Polish people uh, participated at the Holocaust. So if they, if people in Poland publish uh, such statements on Facebook or Twitter, then these companies are forced to give out data um, to the Polish prosecutors. So you can imagine a lot of a lot of conflicts where, in one state, it is legal and they are absolutely not in agreement that the state uh, that this is a crime. But the company still has to the private company still has to comply and give out the data. Um, additionally, especially the direct access, is that if you are um, 
If your data is given out, then you have to fight back in a different, in the, um, using the laws of a different country. And also there are a lot of EU countries where there are a lot of problems with the fairness of a lot of court cases. Um, so if you come back to this example, if Bulgaria requests something from, pro, uh, from a company in Austria, then this request is according to Bul Bulgarian law and not whatever is uh, legal in Austria. So it's possible to have Bulgarian prosecutors are allowed to do more in Austria than Austrian uh, prosecutors. And that doesn't really make sense and, and reduces protections of national protections, for example, in Germany by the, the highest court. Um, so far, it's not possible to veto anything. Uh, according to the draft of the Commission, um, as a state, uh, as country B here, you don't, you at the moment don't have any chance to to fight against it and, or say it's not allowed. It's a little bit different. The current um, draft of the, the European Parliament. The Commission for Civil Liberties wants to introduce a veto right that includes a 10-day period within which the provider can uh, react to the um, extradition um, uh, request by the execution state, for example, because the, um, the action is not a crime in their country. This is not a compulsory um, provision, so the provider has the possibility to um, to have a look into it and um, to uh, write a statement refusing it. So, as um, a digital society, we do not think that this uh, could lead to an altogether um, uh, wide control of data. But what would happen if the provider is located in another state that is not in the European Union? That provider um, has the possibility to address the possibility that um, they, they could um, um, that they could criminalize themselves through those actions. So when it comes to third states being involved, this is um, rather a unilateral directive. So, of course, there is an incentive for other states to um, postulate regulations that would um, allow for the data to be extracted and delivered to other countries. So, uh, my association, Digital Society, has um, posted an open letter to the European um, parliamentarians residing in Germany. And there is also an English version of that letter, and we are ex in exchange with other media representatives and other organizations. So one last regulation that I would like to talk about is the Cybercrime Convention that dates back to 2001 and is about harmonizing cr um, what is considered a crime and also um, regulates um, legal aid. 
and there has been an additional protocol that uh, would have um, countries be able to directly have other countries send over data. And this involves a lot more states. Um, there, as far as we know, there are 64 states, um, such as Argentina, Australia, Chile, Japan, um, Morocco, and many others. So. Um, problems that we currently have in the EU uh, will be exported to other countries, so to say. So we have seen that uh, national authorizations are transgressing borders and often they digress from um, the principle that um, like fundamental rights are being protected and there is the notion that data can't be considered territorial. Jennifer Daskal, an US scientist, for example, says or has a few arguments um, why that should be okay, because um, data is fluid like a water bottle and they are very fast and they can also be present at many locations at the same time. And also um, data is controlled by third parties, so sometimes um, people don't have a choice as to where their data is saved. But if you look at data as non-territorial, you have a few fundamental problems. For example, because um, the protection of fundamental rights cannot be um, guaranteed in a country where it should be protected. So the national sovereignty would be at stake. And I would also say that it isn't really about internationalization and um, countries finding um, standards, but it's about nationalization and national needs and requirements that are being reinforced. So you shouldn't romanticize it, but I would say that the internet still is a space where pol um, certain political action can take place. And this is at stake when we talk about um, physically connecting the internet with um, the legal authorizations of a country and this um, limits freedoms that we have at the moment and that we need and in some way we can see the internet as an asylum for um, people to take political action. For example, if you think of Hong Kong where um, activists have to stay anonymous. It is very important that um, services like Reddit or Telegram or um, other services that are not located in Hong Kong or China and where um, the Chinese government doesn't have access to. So many companies that are located in the US um, do not um, hand over data to Turkey and for very good reasons, as I'm convinced. And if those companies were um, obligated to hand over this kind of data, which hasn't happened yet, but would, would, which would be the next logical step, then many doors um, would be closed. So that doesn't mean that this kind of communication can't take place anymore and that doesn't mean that activists won't find ways to communicate. So, for example, they can use proxy service and VPN, but still um, it, is, it restricts people in their 
political leeway, and that is uh, cons and a considerable um, thing. So we also see um, a reduction of press freedom. So um, action, political action that is taking place in clouds wouldn't um, be able to function like it is working now. More concretely, um, you can see the statement on the slide. So, in a Supreme Court case in the U.S., it was stated that if the U.S. take the right to um, hand over data to other countries, then other countries would um, do the same. And there's also the argument that um, people don't define the uh, location where their data is stored themselves. I think there's many cases, especially with politically active uh, people that do make a conscious choice on where they save their data. And pragmatically, that would also result in a decision being um, dropped. And um, that locations become impossible. And lastly, you have the provider as the only instance who would be able to refuse to kind of carry out these um, the action of uh, handing over data. And this should be the job of um, state agencies, actually. So what is um, something that is also exciting is this statement that in the Microsoft warrant case, there was a warning against um, U.S. regulations having ramifications on other countries and, and of the effectiveness of international cooperation in criminal persecution. So they say that unilateralism will lead to conflicts between countries and uh, will lead to corrupted cooperation and also to um, localization. Um, obligations, and this would um, fraction up the internet. So, um, lastly, I would like to recommend some literature to you uh, for those who are interested in um, further researching this topic. Burchard, for example, and uh, Jennifer Daskal with a deterritorial de approach, and Martin Böse, which is a very um, um, a very large compendium of um, the evidence. Um, you often see the postulation that um, there should be no restrictions on the internet, and if you think about these measures being implemented, what ramifications could it have? In many political discourses, you don't really talk talk about the uh, criminal consequences and uh, persecutional consequences. And I think that I can make it clear that um, international um, cooperation in um, criminal persecution there can be spaces um, for political activism between countries that um, have differing laws and legislation and where um, data cannot be handed over at the moment. And if even um, people who have been in the um, persecution system warn against this kind of legislation, that this can't be the right solution. So whether we are going to have this um, network of um, data being handed over from country to country or not, 
das System uns dann eher über den Kopf zusammenbrechen wird, das kann ich nicht so richtig vorhersehen. Is, uh, I cannot ähm, really say. Tatsächlich Strafverfolgung so ein Stück weit effektiver But if you want effective criminal will, then, persecution, you would have to um, make better processes and proceedings and um, follow the decisions that have been taken in 2014 and 2017 and evaluate them and see where you can take further action. But you cannot just um, blanket um, introduce this kind of legislation. I think this is very problematic. So that's it from my side. If you like um, the work from my um, association, I would love um, for you to donate or become a member or join one of our events. Thank you very much. So, now we have time left for some Q&A. We have three microphones in the room, so um, please get to the microphones. So, I will ask the Internet first. Are there questions from the Internet? There are no questions from the Internet, which is the first time. So, the first question from Mike 2, please. Hello and thank you. Can you say something about um, judge provisions after this provision? So from the e-evidence draft, there are three versions, one from Commission and one from Parliament, which isn't really done yet, and from the draft Burger Zippel presented, and which is a first guess of what the Parliament might um, conclude with. Uh, said that it should be an independent organization, independent body, meaning that according to the for Germany, the, it, they have to be judges because the, the prosecutors in Germany aren't independent. So the, the target state of the uh, with the target state controls. Um, from the, the draft from the Commission, there is something similarly, but only restricted, only for very similar, uh, for uh, very intimate data, um, for for messaging data, for example, but just for metadata. This is not. This does not hold. I would be interesting interested. If there is a conflict between the um, EU and this evidence provision, what could be a possible result? And how could that conflict be cleared? So the conflict we have at the moment, which is maybe what you're referring to, that's between the GDPR and the Cloud Act, is that what you mean? Yes, I mean that. And um, if if that idea becomes into law and then it is not com compatible with current law, what will happen then? Cloud Act e-evidence situation. So at the moment for a provider, if I get a request from the S, there is like the larger pressure from the S, but I don't know if there has been such a case where companies violated GDPR uh, law, uh, regulations by giving data to the yes, but I, I assume it's true, but I haven't heard from any German um, organizations getting active. If you want to, to sanction them, you have to take into account that the companies are in kind of a bad situation and didn't really want to violate law. Um, the European law uh, court don't really consider this at the moment. The e-evidence GDPR clash, um, I can't re with a norm conflict, I can't really say it at the moment because the conflict I refer to with the Cloud Act is about if you transfer data from the EU to another third country and this is 
not included the e evidence at the moment. Okay, then this is unfortunately it for all the questions. Um, you may address the, um, the speaker at the stage. And I would like to thank um, the speaker and warm applause for her. Thank you.